Sit two behind, yeah. Thank you, Sue. Sue could read my mind. I love that. <laughs> We're going to go ahead, Sue. We're going to go ahead and pray. crying because she couldn't come because she was overtired and crazy Don't read into that too much. All right. Good evening, everyone. Grace and peace to you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Glad to be with you all. Pardon the, the little frazzledness that you might see on me. We're just making a couple of adjustments. Uh, and uh, that's what we're about as the church is adapting to the challenges that are ahead of us. We can't canoe the mountains. That's right. That's right. Someone's been listening. So, Hey, I want to welcome and thank you all for coming to the last, aw, sad, last evening of the revival. 
of 2020. But it's been a good time, hasn't it? It's been good to have Reverend Rick here with us. Also, greetings to everyone watching us on Cyberspace in Facebook. It's good to have you with us as well. So with that, I'm going to invite you to stand up. We're going to join in once again in our litany of revival. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from them from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. We seek your face, O Lord. Restore us, O Lord God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. Light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. Will you not revive us again, Lord, so that your people may rejoice in you? Revive us, Heavenly Father. Come, Holy Spirit. We seek Jesus. In these dark days, we are reminded that best of all, God is with us. Best of all, and best of all, let's pray. God, indeed, you are with us. We are grateful for your presence. Uh, we are grateful to be together uh, warm uh, on this oddly chilly October evening. Lord, we pray that you would continue to turn our hearts and minds towards you uh, by your Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray that you would speak to us and through us, that you would prepare us for this time uh, in our hearts and our minds, in order that we might be sanctified by your Holy Spirit, transformed and made more and more in your image, God in order that we would go forth from this place and transform the world, bringing the kingdom of God here on earth just a little bit more. Lord, we pray this in your holy name. Amen. And I invite you to remain standing as we begin our worship this morning, this evening. Ah, I did it, this evening, as we begin our worship this evening.
I invite you to go ahead and be seated. Uh, it is uh, a custom where two or more United Methodists are gathered. There will usually be a potluck and we'll also take up a collection as well. 
that seems to be standard, standard operating procedure, and it is a good one. And so uh, the collection goes to a love offering for bringing uh, Pastor Rick in from Asbury UMC. And so I want to invite you guys to give generously as the ushers wait upon us. Thank you, Sue. I invite you to stand and we will join in declaring our faith together in the Apostles' Creed. And if you guys have it memorized, there it is. All right. And we say together, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. I invite you guys to be seated. And uh, Reverend Rick, once again, it, do, it, it might feel like we were just here, and that's a good thing. We were just here. Yes, that's right. Can't miss it. That. that could be. Testing. Are we good? There we go. There we go. That's the backup. Hey, here, take this right here. This is the follow-up from June 26, 2011 that you might want to look at. There you go. Press him on it. All right, so there you go. I, I had it last night, and I went back home with it, so I thought, okay, one more shot, brother. So there you go. Hey, it's good to be back. It's, you know, this has been great. Uh, crazy weather, icy, cold, yucky, and, and yet we're having good, good turnout. Young folks, it's good to see all of you. I know, I know you don't have to be here tonight. I mean, why do you want to go see a, a white-haired dude standing up here? But uh, it didn't used to be that color, trust me. Uh, but then I became a pastor. <laughs> wait, brother, you just wait. Uh, your time's coming. Hopefully it won't be, a, you, you, you won't get any gray hair here, I'm sure. It'll be fine. But anyways, uh, and I love the fact that uh, you've all done the Apostles' Creed every night. Um, there's something about that because, you know, uh, we have some issues in, in our church these days, in the church uh, universal, but in our denomination, and, and a lot of it has to do with the things we believe. 
And uh, the very fact that we come together to proclaim this which we believe is so important because there are many now who would stand in the pulpits like you and I and say, we don't believe that stuff. And that's why we're facing many of the things we face today. That's for a whole other con uh, conversation, which I'll come back and have with you sometime on a separate night. But um, it's great to be, be, be back, uh, actually for this third time. So uh, I appreciate it. Wow, appreciate that so much. Thank you for all coming out. Thank you for the music, all the music team. Appreciate that every night. And I know it takes a little time to get all that done. And it's not like you don't have real jobs out there somewhere and so forth. So thanks for doing that. It takes time to do that. We appreciate that. And uh, uh, Sue and Roger, thanks for supper tonight. My wife was not feeling quite right. So yeah, she said, I don't want people thinking I have COVID. So she stayed home tonight. Uh, uh, so she missed out on that. But it is good to be here. And thank you to all of you. And um, it, it's just, it's been a wonderful time. And, you know, hopefully we can do it again sometime. I will, I, I do want to come back though and talk about some of the things happening in the life of the church and uh, we'll, we'll get that scheduled out, Aaron, sometime. Uh, maybe it'll be a little warmer. Although, who knows the way this year's going. You know, why, I heard somebody say, you know, next weekend we turn the clocks back. And they're saying, why would we want one more hour of 2020? <laughs> right? But here we are. It's where we're at. So, uh, if you recall, and those of you on the other side of the screen, I'm glad that you're joining us this evening. And I'm praying that you were, have been able to join us. If not... Maybe for the first time tonight. I put a little video out on Facebook a little while ago while they were up practicing. I did a little selfie video thing and said, Hey, third night, Cheney America, take, go ahead and watch on the Facebook page. That's all you up there. And join us. So we'll see if we have some more viewers. We're advertising for you, brother. Yeah, viral, not virus. <laughs> Although the gospel is infectious. There's another sermon. There's so many sermons, so little time. Uh, all right. Well, we, we began talking uh, a couple nights ago about that wide door of opportunity uh, that is before us. And, and, and honestly, uh, yes, this COVID thing has caused us to trip up a little bit as well as all the other things, but there's been some opportunities that have, coming, uh, that have come out of it. So I want us to pay attention to those things. Last night we talked about, well, how do we how do, we do that? How, how, we can't really do that on our own. We can't really go through the door on our own. And, and so we really need to press into Jesus. And so we talked about what that looked like as, as the crowd who pressed into Jesus. And then as he uh, told them to push out. And sometimes we push back in the midst of the pushing out. And uh, to get out into that deeper water and following Jesus. But uh, I think we got the point. I mean, that whole call to uh, take those steps and, and, and press into Jesus that we might go into that deeper water. And, and so tonight I want to I pick up from that and, and talk more you know, on the pressing on, which was the song you sang last night, thank you. And, uh, and we'll get to that here shortly. But, you know, we, I have a really a good friend at the church there at Asbury. I doubt she's watching tonight, but if she is, Bobby, it's good to see you. Bobby's in her 80s. She's a wonderful, wonderful lady. Just a hoot. And I love her. And, and she's our volunteer on Mondays, but since March... She has not, she's basically been confined in, in the house. It's driving her insane. We've seen her a few times, but hardly at all, and, and, it's, and she's going crazy. But she always had a, has a word of the day for Pastor Rick on Mondays. And I always appreciate that about, it, about her. One, day, one week, it was, uh, it, the word was hallelujah. And mainly because she's a Chiefs fan, and the Chiefs had just won the day before. So, okay, we'll give it to you, Bobby. You're a Chiefs fan. Good for you, and so forth. Well, I was thinking about her today as I was coming tonight. So I texted her. She's 80-some years old, and she'll text. It was awesome. It's awesome. So we were going back and forth. I said, Bobby, what's the word for the day? I need a word for the day. And um, she cheated a little bit and used three words. She used three words. And she said, shake it up. <laughs> Sounds like a song. <laughs> Shake it up, and actually she'd written a whole bunch more, but she said, this weather, it's shaking us all up. What's going on around here? It's cold, and it's icy, and it's snowy, and all this kind of stuff, but, but shake it up. So, okay, I don't know if she was saying, when you get the Cheney, shake it up. Uh, that's God's business, uh, but we'll lift some things up here tonight. Another word that comes to mind, though, as I think about words, is this word. Have you ever used this? Stick to itiveness. 
You ever use that word before? Stick to itiveness. Uh, I use it a lot when I have couples come in to talk to me uh, for premarriage counseling, premarital counseling. I said, tell me about your stick to itiveness. I mean, I know because I'm the pastor, you're going to tell me all the stuff that you think I want to hear, but I want to know, I mean, really, honestly, what, what makes you think you're even going to be married five years from now? Based on statistics, your odds aren't very good. Tell me about that. What's your stick to itiveness? Are you really going to stick to it? Are you really going to keep after it? Are you, are you going to really uphold those vows that you say you're going to make and so forth? And so I push them on that. And I want to push us on that as far as who we are as Christians, our stick to itiveness, that we keep at it, that we go for it with regards to what it means to follow Jesus. Last night I spoke of the importance of pressing into Jesus, that intentionality, and that intentionality implies that there's an intensity of what we do. And so um, tonight I want to talk about not only pressing in, but pressing on. Last night, pressing into Jesus. Tonight, pressing on into the faith. All right? I'll look at a couple passages, mainly one, as we look in, in Philippians here shortly, uh, to help us in our quest to follow Jesus. And, and, you know, they always tell us, now don't go mixing metaphors. But, you know, this text just calls for mixed metaphors, so I'll get to that here in a little bit. So, so don't shoot me down if you're an English major or something. Uh, the Bible's doing it, so I'm just, I'm just sharing it with you, okay? Uh, the text allows me to do so. So I want to look at a passage. It's in Philippians chapter 3, verses 10 through 14. If you have your Bibles, Philippians 10, I mean, Philippians 3, 10 through 14. Uh, or if you have your phones. I know people use them, as I said last night. They're looking up Scripture these days on their phones, all right? So Paul's in the midst of a, of a conversation with the church of Philippi about not having the confidence in the flesh. He's explaining a little, about, little bit about who he is, about, uh, about the reason he has a confidence to put the faith in him, but not in just him because of the thing he's, he's done, but in Jesus. And, and he's talking about all these things that he's done before, and really, he could put up all sorts of great certificates on his wall because of how great a guy and how, how wonderful he's been in the past with regards to his religious zeal, and he went to the particular right seminary and all these kind of things with regards to his schooling, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, as Jew of Jews, etc. But he goes on and, and picks up in this conversation saying, I leave all of that behind that I might indeed follow Jesus. And so here's what he says starting in verse 10. Listen to these words. I want to know Christ. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. I want to know Christ. Now, let's brainstorm. So, this is not rhetorical, this question. This means this is your opportunity to respond verbally. And you on Facebook, shout it out in your living room, all right? But if you could do anything, or if you could have done anything in your life, what would it have been or what would it be now? Anybody? Archaeology. There you go. Let's go dig up some stuff and see what we can find. Okay, what else? Oh, come on now. We got 40 people here, so 50, whatever. Play piano. Yeah, yeah. What would you like to be? Basketball player? Yeah, okay. That's awesome. Anybody else over here? Yeah, what would you like to be? Agriculture engineer. Wow. That's awesome. You want to be something else besides a basketball player? A scientist. You could be a scientific basketball player. 
Oh, you, I wish you on Facebook could have seen her eyes. It's awesome. She gave me the look. You know, like, what you talking about, Willis? You remember that from the old days? You young kids, Google it. What you talking about, Willis? Google it. All right? So, all right. I was, did you ever have to take CPE? You didn't have to say, take CPE. Uh, CPE is called Clinical Pastoral Education, which was required for me to be ordained. And so I had to go, and I did it at Wesley. I was living at Salina at the time, drove back and forth to Wesley Hospital once a week. I uh, was on call overnight, but it was in classes all day with chaplaincy, chaplaincy work and so forth. One of the other pastors who was there um, shared at the end as we, were, as we were finishing up the course, you learn a lot about yourself, you learn a lot about the people you're in the class with and so forth. And it was kind of like, here's what I really wanted to be. <laughs> I'll never forget this. He says, I always wanted to drive a beer truck. Pastor, drive a beer truck. Pastor, drive a beer truck. Sometimes pastoring makes you want to drive a beer truck. <laughs> or more. But uh, to keep in the spirit of things. All right, just stick with me. You know, you know. So, I, th I just laugh about that all the time. I think, you want to drive a beer truck? Dang, such a failure. Oh, I became a pastor. Anyways, well, I'm not sure, you know, Paul's desire, you know, his goals were a little higher than driving the beer truck. Um, hopefully, a, a little greater yearning or longing is there for you than maybe driving the beer truck, uh, and especially as a Christian. If you notice, in verse 10, Paul says, I want to know Christ. I want to know Christ. All else aside, I'll throw my uh, certificates away, all that stuff I've achieved. It doesn't matter. He even called it garbage. Actually, the literal word in the Greek was dung. I consider it the garbage. I want to know Christ, no matter all that I've accomplished. And to know here in this language, in this understanding, is to know, it, it's more than knowing up here, upstairs. It's more than knowledge. Now, that's important, but the word here is, to, is experiential. It's to personally experience, to have firsthand relational acquaintance with Jesus the Christ, the Messiah. I want to have that relationship. You know, Paul, this is Paul, and you're going, wow, Paul, man, you're, you're Paul. You're the Apostle Paul. You want, it's like, don't you know Christ? And he's saying, in essence, not near how I want to know him. I want more. I want more. I want more. What I've experienced is not yet enough. When I was in high school, oh, Sue, we were talking about Ken Forsyth, right? My music teacher uh, back in, in Marion High School. And uh, we came to Wichita. Now, for us, go to Wichita was a big deal. It's like, oh, the big city. And um, we came to sing. Some of you who've been around a little while, do you remember the Joyce Livingston show? Anybody here? Yeah, Channel 12. Channel 12, we came and sang on the Joyce Livingston show. Our high school, led by our, our uh, instructor, Ken Forsyth, we sang, Give Me Jesus. You think they're going to let us sing that nowadays? But we sang, Give Me Jesus. And I'm telling you, it was so sweet. And, and they were running out of time. I just barely remember it. But we were running out of time. And so they were going to have to cut us off before we finished the song. And she said, Don't you stop. Keep singing. Finish the song. I mean, she was caught up in Give Me Jesus. The one who... Uh, oversaw that show it's, it's awesome you can have all the world but give me Jesus is what it says in that song in this context uh, basically Paul is saying give me Jesus give me give I don't you, you can have all this other stuff give me Jesus and he says in verses 10 through 11 he says I want to know the power of his resurrection I want to know the participation or the fellowship of his suffering I want to become like Christ in his death that somehow I may attain the resurrection of the dead. Now, there's four sermons right there. 
That's four more nights, brother. I mean, there's so much here, I don't have time to, to, to flesh all that out. But I want to know the power of his resurrection. I mean, if you think about it, how does that happen? How many of you have experienced someone rising from the dead? The power of resurrection. I got a, call, I got a text at three, almost 4 o'clock this morning. It was my brother saying they were heading to Salina. My sister-in-law, his wife's mother, uh, had hours to live. They said, you need to get here. And at 6.38 this morning, she passed. Just like that. I mean, it was boom, boom, boom. And I think the power of his resurrection. Ain't no grave going to hold this body down. And that's what Paul's talking about. The power of that, that we enter into that. And then to know the fellowship or the participation of his suffering. Now, it's not like, I don't know about you, but I do remember my prayer time this morning. I didn't just look at the wall like I, like I said last night. This was a better morning. Uh, and, I, and there was some pretty, I felt fairly good prayer going on, uh, you know, in that. But I did not pray, Lord, I, 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 don't, I don't remember praying, I want to participate in your suffering today. I mean, honestly. But the reality of the prayer is that as we enter into relationship with Jesus, we enter into the totality of that relationship. That just as he suffered for us, we too are called to suffer for him should that take place. And suffering can be seen in a variety of ways, but the bottom line is that it's a commitment issue that we are sold out for Jesus. And he says, I want to become like Christ in his death. And by that, that there is victory in that. You sang that the other night, I think. A victory in Jesus. Page 370 in the hymnal, by the way. Victory in Jesus. Uh, he plunged me to victory. And so that victory, I, I want to become like Christ in, in his death, that I would die to sin and that I would rise again and that I would be victorious over that death, that somehow, he says, I may attain the resurrection of the death. I don't, I don't believe Paul is saying uh, that that somehow like there's doubt there I think it's just like this is so mysterious and so magnificent and so awesome I want to be a part of that and somehow somehow I will be by virtue of my faith in you and so those things are playing out and, and verse 12, Paul is honest and he says, I've not yet taken possession or I've not yet obtained all that Christ has for me. In other words, Paul is saying, you know what, there's some more things that Jesus has for me. I, you know, if we think about Paul, we're going, wow, look at all the stuff you've already accomplished. He's saying, I have a long ways to go. He says, I have not yet arrived at my goal in verse 12. How about, how, let me ask you all. Have you arrived? Have you arrived at your goal? What is your goal in light of who, where you are in Christ? Where are you on that? Where are you on that trek? If we think about arriving. That's a, you know, this is a good lesson if we're going to talk about John Wesley. I mean, it's a great lesson about sanctification. It's about a great lesson about what it means to go on to what Wesley would call perfection or completion or maturity or to grow up into Christ uh, that we would not. Here, here's our problem in the life of the church sometimes is that we can notch the belt. We'll lead someone to Jesus, put a notch in the belt. We go, praise God. We led someone, someone to Jesus and then we left them there. It's like, whoa, now what? You know, uh, it's like J.D. Walt said, he writes for the seedbed, you know, he writes for the daily text and seedbed. And he said, oh, that was such awesome news, you know, that when he came to Christ, that he was freed from his sins, that he was forgiven of his sins, and that he was going to go to heaven. And it was really great news if he was 80. But he was 25 at the time, and he's saying, what happens between now and 80? Is there something for me to, as far as growing into him and all that great experience? And yes, acknowledging that there's the, that great assurance I'm going to go to heaven, but what about heaven on earth now in this process? And so this faith is not static that we're a part of. It is a process. And Paul speaks out of our working out uh, our salvation in other places in Scripture. Not working for our salvation. We can't do that. It's only Jesus who works uh, for our salvation on the cross. The work that he did saves us. But we continue to work that out. And so we press on. We press on. And it's interesting. Well, before I get there, let me share this. Some of you maybe know me a little bit. And if, if not, I like to hunt. 
I, I like to hunt. It is deer hunting season as we speak, all right? And I like to bow hunt, all right? And it's, 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 a, it's a challenge, and there's just something about it. And the thing is, if I don't get a deer, that's okay. It's just awesome to go. Now, if I get a deer, that's even, that's awesomer. Is that a word? Awesomer? What did they teach you in school? Is that a word? Awesomer? Just, yeah, yeah, yeah. It works for me. So I think it's awesomer. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I was out the other night, last Friday night, and uh, I was going to help my dad and my brother. The early, early, we are going to get up at 4.30 in the morning the next morning to go out to the Flint Hills to move some cattle. I was going to help them. It's my therapy from being a preacher, all right? And so uh, I went out and sat in a deer stand Friday evening, and I didn't even take my bow because I did not want to be tempted just in case something actually did come by. I had no time to take care of it because I had work to do the next day. So uh, guess what? Three deer come by. <laughs> None were big. They, they weren't very big, but it was just cool. I've got it on video. I can prove it if you don't believe me. Uh, but anyways, it, it was just fun. It's just, it's just cool. And I, I love to hunt and, and, and do that. And there's something about that because this pressing on, this is a hunting term that, that uh, Paul uses. It's a hunting term. It means to pursue with all haste. Many times as I hunt, that has been the case. I may see something. I like to go elk hunting uh, up in the mountains too. And, and you, if you see an elk, last year, praise the Lord, I got, a, I got my bucket list. I brought home a big six by six last year. First time ever. You want pictures? <laughs> Honestly. But uh, there's something about, man, you see that elk out there, and it's several hundred yards away. And if you're bow hunting, or even as I was doing last year with a muzzle loader, I mean, that's, that's too far. You've got to get there, and you've got to pursue, and, and all that goes into that. And so many times in hunting, there is this pressing on that takes place. And it's interesting that Paul uses this word. Now, it needs to be defined in its context because it's, understand, it's understood in a positive way and it's understood in a negative way. In a positive way, if it's in the context of a positive, in a positive context, the pursuing is to chase after, okay? Is the chasing after and then coming upon whatever it is that you're pursuing. In the negative, it has to do with persecution. It has to do with persecution. I will hunt you down till I get you. Wherever you go, brother, I will hunt you down till I get you. See? And that's what, and that's, that's what would happen in, the, in, in Rome. They knew that that would happen from time to time. So th they were hearing him. Okay? And so... In, this is in the positive. I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. This take hold means to grab something in a firm manner. No, no, I'll never let go. Were you guys working on that song? No. It's just a song out there, okay? Google it. Uh, never let go. It's that grabbing on. But in this context, it's, it's even to appropriate. It means to make my own. Not only to grab hold, but then to make my own. Not someone else's. It's, it's, not, it's not my dad's faith or my grandpa's faith, even though they both had a faith. It is my faith because I grab hold and take onto it for myself. That way I can then come to know Christ in maybe ways that they have known. See? And so we think back, to, think back with me, if you will to when Christ took hold of you. Think about that time when you knew that you knew that you knew that Jesus loved you, was there to forgive you, was there to give you new life. Can you think of when that time was? And even if, even if you can't pinpoint a moment, but to know that you know that He has taken hold of you, that, that He has offered Himself to you, and by him taking hold of you, you respond by taking hold of him. You know, Paul, in Acts chapter 9, was on this road to Damascus. He was out to kill people like you and me. That was his goal. In essence, he was pressing on in the negative to persecute, to go after people like us, because he saw us as a threat to what he thought was right as far as the Jewish law is concerned and so forth. And then he had a come to Jesus moment in that particular chapter as Jesus appeared to him and said, 
Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And on and on. And here he was transformed. His life was flipped upside down. And then through all of this, as Christ took a hold of him, then Paul took a hold of, of Jesus. And, and, and here he's saying now that he still wants more. I want to know Christ. Don't ever forget that Christ has taken hold of you. That is good, good news. Good news. And sometimes... Even though he'll never let go of us, there's tendencies that we seem to loosen our grip. And I think that's why we have things like this. Just to, to remind us, to bring us back together, to challenge us a little bit, to, 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 to strengthen our grip once again on Jesus. Therefore, that's why we must press on because there's times where we just, uh, stuff happens and, and things get in the way and we get distracted and there's this and there's that and all sorts of circumstances and pretty soon we get so sidetracked, we lose sight of, of the goal of where we're going and pretty soon we're bouncing, as my professor would say in seminary, we're going ditch to ditch, boom, 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 and can't figure out why we can't stay on the highway following Jesus. There's a call for us to press on. A little while back, I got an email, and it popped up um, with this article by a guy named Greg Stover called Pressing On. I said, and I'm saying to myself, what are you doing stealing my sermon title? What are you doing? That's what we do, though. We borrow them. Uh, and so it's a wonderful article. I remember reading it a while back, and I have taken a few things from it over the, over the years. But, you know, this whole thing of pressing on, the reason it's important to him is it's important to me is it's important to us. As Christians, we are all called to press on. A lot of folks, though, struggle at it, to keep at it. They get nervous if they get too close. Remember, if you get too close to Jesus last night, all of a sudden people can get kind of nervous and anxious. And, and sometimes people get fearful about what, what may be going on and, Maybe Jesus is going to ask us some things that, oh, maybe we don't want that to happen or whatever. And, or else just, just the things of life where we just, you know, I, I just want to give up. I'm tired of this. And, you know, right now this COVID thing, I don't know about you, but I'm pretty tired of it. it, it I'm, I think most people are done with it, but I don't think it's done with us yet for a little while. So we've got to keep at it. We've got to stay faithful and press on in the faith in the midst of all that's going on. In the midst of these kind of things, uh, we, we have to be careful that, that we don't think we've arrived because we haven't. We have a ways to go yet. We need to keep moving forward. Cling to Jesus. We've not yet arrived. I know I've not yet arrived. I, I can tell you that. I can be honest. If my wife is here, she could tell you all sorts of things. Uh, maybe that's a good thing. <laughs> but, you know, I've not yet arrived. I've got a ways to go. But I know one thing. Just like Paul, you know, he's had his credentials and, and wonderful things in the past. But he just says, I can't, I, I can't go back there. I need to forget those things. And I know I've had some good things happen in my past at times, and I want to dwell on those, but I can't do that. That's back there somewhere, and I'm, I'm seeking to go there where Jesus is calling me to take hold of what he's called, or how, of how he's taking hold of me. So therefore, we, we strain, this word, we strain toward what is ahead. And here's where I'm mixing the metaphors for you English people in here. Okay? It's an athletic term here. Rather than the uh, hunting term, it's an athletic term. This athletic term is that much uh, in the world of racing. You know, when you're running the race, there's that strain that takes place. It means to stretch intensely forward. And in this case, to receive the full impact of the power of the resurrection. To strain for that. The power. You know, my sister-in-law, she's grieving today over the loss of her mother, but yet she's rejoicing that she no longer suffers. She's rejoicing that she's experiencing the great promise of the resurrection. No more tears, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more heartache. Praise Jesus, right? Praise Jesus. I mean, if we as Christians don't have that kind of hope, we are the most to be pitied. So, so we strain towards that with the knowing of the power that's there and the assurance that's there. The impact of the power. And there's something interesting to me. Uh, because a lot of times when power is used in Scripture, the Greek word is dunamis, where we get the word dynamite. So it's very explosive. It's very explosive. But I want to ask sometimes the church this. Why are you all just trying to light those little lady fingers? Anybody remember those little tiny lady fingers? Remember back in the day 
And some of you are all looking at me like, what the heck are you talking about? You on Facebook, just hang in there. They're called wimpy firecrackers, all right? You remember, they're those little wimpy things. I mean, you could almost hold them in your hand and let them blow up, but then there could be a little pain. Uh, there was a little pain. <laughs> but then you get to the black cats, you know. Then you get to the M80s. Sweet, over town on Halloween, which somebody told me about. And then, yeah, you're with me, aren't you? And, and, and then you get the dynamite. Like where my grandpa used to live, there was a rock quarry. And every now and then you'd hear, you'd hear this boom and the dishes in the house would shake because they were, they were blowing up the limestone in the quarry. We're talking explosive power of the resurrection that's promised by Jesus. And Paul is saying, I want to know that power. I want to experience that. I want to be a part of that. I want to know Christ and the totality of who he is and what he has for me. And I think we want that as well. He's running this race. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Isn't that what we're doing? Isn't that why we're here? Isn't that what our goal is, to press on heavenward? And not just that we would go to heaven, but that we might experience heaven even now, right here on earth. Everlasting glory is before us now. It's to be experienced in, 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 in the bits and pieces of our everyday life. This side of the finish line. I mean, this side. We, we, we have a ways to go yet. We don't want to hang on to the past. Can't keep looking back. The back, past is behind us and so forth. We must finish the race. Strain ahead. Push on. Push out. Press in. Press on. Too many people, too many people are giving up. And sadly, so many of these people call themselves Christians. There's something wrong with that picture. For we as Christians... I'm not saying we don't go through tough times. I'm not saying any of that. But there, there's something about following Jesus that gives us strength and gives us courage and gives us the ability to keep on keeping on, to be able to press on in, in what we do in following Jesus because Jesus has set the greatest example for us as, we've, as he's gone to the cross on our behalf. We don't want to give up and just wring our hands and call it quits. And what I've seen a little bit with some of the leadership in churches across the way is, is that it's kind of like we'll hide under a rock, like I said the first night, until this thing passes over. Well, people aren't looking for, for someone to lead under a rock. They're looking for someone to lead on the front lines to help guide and direct and help them through difficulties that we can, cling, that we can push on and press on towards the prize before us. So don't give up, friends. Do not give up. Press into Jesus and press on in the faith. I love what the writer of Hebrews says. To really a, a church that was going through some struggles. And he just had shared a chapter, chapter 11. He just had shared this what we call the great hall of faith. Of all these people who had pressed on. Who had been faithful to the end. He listed them name after name after name. And he talked about how we enter in, how we walk along, ultimately how that we come to completion by our walking alongside them uh, in the faith. And then he says in chapter 12, verse 1, he says, And since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, you know the ones that pressed on, let us throw off everything that hinders. You can't grab onto Jesus if you're hanging onto those things that hinder and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Listen, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. We can't, we can't press on unless our eyes are fixed on Jesus. So friends, as we go uh, from these three days together, I pray that we would be paying attention to, to the doors that are in front of us, to the opportunities that are before us, and that we would look to them and, and see that, hey, these are opportunities for us. We can go through that door, that we wouldn't see it as a barricade, but we'd see it as an entryway 
And then in order to do that, that we would press into Jesus and know that he calls us to push on and push out. And that we would then press on in the faith, keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus as we do so. And so I want to challenge you in that. Press on towards the goal to win the prize. The prize is out there, but it's not just out there. It's here right now as we know Christ today and forever. So with that in mind, we will cross the finish line in victory. Let it be so. Let's pray. God, we give you thanks for this time that we've had. I give you thanks for your word. I give you thanks for a guy named Paul who you took and just turned his world upside down, that you transformed him in such a way that, uh, that he changed the world by his, his witness. I pray, Lord, that you'd change our parts of the world by our witness. I pray, Lord, that we would see the doors of opportunities that are before us. I pray that we would walk through them. I pray that we would press into you. I pray that we'd press on in the faith and that we'd be faithful to you as you are faithful to us. Thank you for these good folks out here at Cheney. I pray your blessing on them. I pray that you'd continue to work in and through them, that they'd be a light in this community. They'd be salt and light for those who are struggling in this community, that they'd know there's a place and there's people that they can go to who, uh, who can help them, provide them with answers through you. I pray your blessing on each person tonight. I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would be at work in them to, in such a way that uh, you'd draw them to a closer relationship with you. Let it be, Lord, that all of us would, would say, we want to know Christ. And not just in an academic way, but to experience you and have relationship with you. We give you thanks and we give you praise. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So I have something this evening. Um, this is not a bribe to get you to come to the altar. <laughs> but uh, I was thinking today... Um, I printed off something, and it, you may not see it where you are. You all up here can see it, but there's, there's a door right here in the middle. And the top of it, it says opportunity. And then on the door is printed pressing in and pressing on. And so I would encourage you, and I, I don't know how this COVID thing works. I mean, I, I was going to invite people to all come up, and then I, that might get a little weird too. I don't know how you all... But I'm going to have these. I want you all to have one uh, to take home to keep reminding you of the doors of opportunities that are open before you, to remind you that you're to press in, to remind you that you're to press on. All right? So I think what I'll do is uh, I, I am going to put them on this, on this pew up here. I am going to invite you to come and pray, though. I'm, not, I'm always going to have an invitation. I do want, if you, if you feel an urge to come and pray tonight, that, you would, that you'd make that commitment to take a, another step of what it means to press on, that you would do that, and then pick one of these up on the way. And then if, if, you, know, if you want to just pray in your seats and stuff, and then afterwards come and get one. I do want you all to take one, though. Uh, I think it's a, it's a nice thing to remind you to, to put up. We're going to stand and sing now the Spirit song. Uh, we need the Holy Spirit to guide us. I, I need another week to preach about the Holy Spirit too, but you know, next time. Uh, but let's stand and sing this song together and, and uh, know that the Lord will empower us to do that. Come and pray if you'd like though, just to do that and then pick one of these up, all right? Oh, let the Son of God enfold you with His Spirit and His love. Let him fill his heart and satisfy your soul. Oh, let him have the things that hold you and his spirit like a dove will descend upon your life and make you... If you'd like to pray, feel free to come and do so. Jesus. Oh, Jesus, come and fill your lambs. Jesus, oh, Jesus, come and fill your lambs. 
He will fill you. He will fill you. Let it be so. Come and pray. Oh, let it sing the song of gladness as your hearts are filled. Lift your hands and sweet, lift your hands and sweet surrender to his name. Oh, give him all your tears and sadness. Give him all your years of pain and you'll enter into life. That's the cool part. It's life in Jesus name. Life in Jesus name. Jesus, oh Jesus, come and fill your lands. Jesus, oh Jesus, come and fill. Oh, Jesus, we come before you tonight. We thank you that you fill us. We thank you that you give us your Holy Spirit. We thank you that your promise that you'll never leave us alone has come true through your Spirit who's come. We thank you that you uh, always are there for us. You'll never leave us nor forsake us. We thank you that you empower us and that you strengthen us. Help us, Lord, that as we seek to move forward, that you would strengthen us to do that through the power of your Spirit, that we would press into you and press on in the faith, that as you place the doors of opportunity before us, we would walk through them and do ministry in your name. Let it be so, we pray in the precious name of Jesus. And God's people said, amen and amen. Come and get uh, one of these reminders. It's good, I think, for you. And thank you so much for our time together. Right there.